Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Gert Fuchs. I'm the director of the Georg Eckert Institute uh, for International Textbook Research here in uh, Braunschweig, Germany. And I'm also the speaker of the Leibniz Science Campus uh, Post-Digital post Participation, which is uh, also located um, here in Braunschweig. I very much welcome all of you to our first post-digital digital lunch that's uh, going to take place in, uh, in a few minutes. It's the first kind of this event. Uh, the title is Post-Digital uh, Theory, and I'm very much uh, uh, delighted that uh, two leading thinkers in post-digital theory uh, have accepted our invitation and are joining us for this lunch today. Uh, these are Sarah Hayes and Peter Yandrich. Um, and uh, all that is left for me to say is that I'm very much looking forward to the best lunch of the month. And with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to Felicitas Mecke, Chris, who will lead us uh, through the event today. Thank you, Eckert. Yes, I'm delighted to be able to welcome Sarah Hayes and Peter Yandrich here today for our first inaugural post-digital lunch. Welcome to everyone who's listening and participating as well. Um, I'm especially pleased because we can reflect here in this inaugural and on this specific concept of post-digital. What is this post-digital? What does it do? What do we do with it? What does it open up for us? So I'm going to introduce first Sarah and Peter before we step into our questions and discussion and answers. Before we start, I want to draw everyone's attention to the link underneath the YouTube video to the tweet back. If you click on that link, you can ask any questions throughout the conversation we're having, and we will try to feed in the questions or to have time at the end for questions if you want to ask anything about anything we're mentioning just now or any other aspects. Okay. So Sarah Hayes is Professor in Higher Education Policy at the University of Wolverhampton. Her research sits at the nexus of sociology, technology and education. And particularly interesting for our post-digital campus is that as well as teaching sociology and leading technology enhanced learning team, she's also taught computing in the past. So she's got this interdisciplinary view on things. I first came across Sarah's research in a wonderful article reflecting on the post of post-digital called Between the Post and the Com, post, compost, examining the post-digital work of a prefix, which she wrote together with Christine Sinclair. And then I came across her work further in a further series of a whole bunch of articles of theorizing the post-digital and what this means for the world that we live in. I've also been able to take a sneak preview of her forthcoming book on post-digital po positionality, which I hope we'll be able to speak about in a, a few minutes later. And Sarah is also associate editor of the fantastic journal Post-Digital Education and Science, which I recommend to everybody who's watching at the moment. Peter Yandrich is Professor of Information Science at the University of Applied Sciences in Zagreb in Croatia. He's also visiting professor of, at the University of Wolverhampton and visiting associate professor at the University of Zagreb. He's equally interdisciplinary and trans transdisciplinary in his outlook, with his research focusing at the intersection of critical pedagogy, information and communication technologies. Peter is the author and editor of an enormous number of books and articles which reflect deeply on our post-digital con post condition. And just to mention two from this year, one with Michael Peters, Tina Baisley and Zhu Dong Zhu is called Knowledge Socialism, the Rise of Peer Production, Collegiality, Collaboration and Collective Intelligence, which just touches on so many different topics that are relevant to our campus. And another one with Peter McLaren, Post-Digital Dialogues on Critical Pedagogy, Liberation Theology and Information Technology. And the latter book in particular shows Peter's fascinating research approach that draws on dialogue and conversation. And Peter is editor in chief of the journal I just mentioned, Post Digital Education and Science, with, with some really inspiring articles on a whole bunch of things, also the term post digital and also beyond that. So, thank you so much for joining us, Sarah and Peter. If I could begin with a broad question, Sarah, could you? Tell us something about what brought you to start working with the concept of post-digital. Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, just a, a real pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for inviting us and uh, for um, this low calorie lunch. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you about this, this concept of post-digital. So my quick answer to your question is, well, Peter did, naturally. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's the short answer. The slightly longer answer um, is that we have written and edited together for quite a lot of years now, since uh, 2012, when we first came across each other. But it was probably fairly, Peter will correct me if I'm wrong, it was probably fairly early in 2017 that he broached this topic of post-digital and uh, said that it could be potentially quite fruitful for us to engage with. So that uh, meant that we would have plenty of work ahead and, and we have, but um, it's been absolutely brilliant to, uh, to work with this concept, which we know isn't perfect. We know it's something that, um, in a sense is good because it isn't perfect, because it's very participatory, it means that it's adaptable and it can bring people with it and you know we can shape it together. So that's one of the main attractions for me is the inclusivity that post-digital allows. Um, so it's sort of this interplay between people and things, past, future and, and present. And I suppose much of what's been written already about post-digital before we jumped on board was in the arts. Uh, many, many years ago, um, far too many to remember, I was an art student in Edinburgh, actually, for this ah. <laughs> So I guess that, uh, you know, it sort of it has a, a connection with me there. And then when Peter had us work collectively on the first article that we wrote about for post-digital science and education uh, in 2018, we were acknowledging what had gone before, but we were acknowledging this messiness of the concept, um, but that it could also potentially help us to resist more um, neat, instrumental, neoliberal accounts of, of what's happening around us, um, where technology is often described as this quick fix, this tool, um, this sort of driver of change, which unfortunately then misses out the humanity side of this, um, which I have tended to critique rather heavily in policy discourse. So I hope that wasn't too long an answer. <laughs> no, great. Thank you. Yes. Peter, was that a... No, 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 no. no. Okay. Just a pencil. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that That's something I think is really important, this messiness and the human technology aspect of it as well. Yeah. Peter, um, Sarah mentioned the journal already. Um, why... What was the impetus between launching this journal? That was about the same time in 2017 that you were talking about it with Sarah, right? Yeah, well, thanks a lot. First, I really need to thank everybody for making this event happen. And I'm delighted to, with this, to be invited as a speaker at the inaugural lunch. And I really wish this lunch a productive future. And I also want to thank Eckhart, but also Martin and all the other people in the background who make this uh, uh, event run really smoothly and nicely. So thanks for uh, thanks everybody. Uh, back to your question, my reasons for founding the journal and the book series actually, which accompanies the journal. Uh, well, there are many reasons, but I could probably say a bit more about two more reasons. The first one is political economy of knowledge production and academic publishing. And the second one is social character of knowledge. So Speaking about political economy of knowledge production, uh, it is well known that today's academic work is strongly situated within the attention economy. So you can write the most interesting paper, but if you don't publish this paper in the right place, and if your not, name is not recognized enough to ensure that actually you get enough clicks and citations, then your interesting work will make little impact. And speaking of social no character of knowledge, my research achievements are never just mine. I mean, they're a product of all influences to my thinking from home, family, books and papers I've read. Of course, my many years of relationship with Sarah, but also many other people. And in order to produce good work, we simply all need to live and work in a, what I would say, good environment. So the post-digital science and education journal and book series are an infrastructure, they're a publishing ecosystem, if you want, which slowly builds a community for people interested in post-digital thinking. So eventually, it's not just about what I make of the concept of the post-digital or what Sarah makes of the concept of the post-digital or what anybody else makes of the concept, but it's about what the community will make of the concept together and how this, this concept will develop into the future. And I can tell you it's so exciting, you know, our individual contributions may be useful and, and I'm often probably even too proud of what I'm doing. But we are not just researching, we're also building something larger than our individual work and something larger than ourselves. So as you can see from my answer, I clearly understand knowledge is a deeply social product. Now, 
Sarah and I and a few other people took up this dirty work of building infrastructure around the terminal and the series. It's as simple as that. I mean, somebody's got to do the dirty work. And so in the past few years, I proofread many of these articles and so on. And, you know, do I enjoy doing it? Well, not really, you know, but uh, the community needs to be supported. And also I learned a lot in the process because I get to read each and every article very deeply. So to wrap up my answer, theoretical, practical, and empirical aims of post-digital science and education journal and book series are quite simple, actually. We are now developing an infrastructure and the community for good post-digital research to make sure that post-digital research has a proper base so that so that it can thrive and continue to develop in the future. I love this idea of um, of publishing or as a journal as an infrastructure, not just not just not just a not just as knowledge itself, but also as an infrastructure. Yeah. Would would you get? I mean, would, would you? There could be all sorts of different understandings of post digital come into the journal. Then, right? Like really broad understandings that are quite contradictory. What would you do? with those different contradictory means? Is that part of the messiness that you accept and celebrate? Or is there a limit at some point? Perhaps Peter first and then. Well, uh, we make editorial decisions together. So it's not just about me. Really, all papers undergo quite a few rounds of peer review and this kind of things. And Sarah is heavily involved in this almost as much as I am. And, but the key idea is that we will publish everything which is well argued so mm -hmm. if it's a, if it's a good paper we're going to publish it even if it doesn't even if it disagrees with us completely even those papers which i which disagree with me for instance i tend to send them to review to other people who disagree with me so they may probably perhaps do something together so mm -hmm. the idea is that actually we you know uh, uh, when i speak about the post digital community I'm not speaking about the community, which is uh, one mind, which is narrow-minded, which is one-minded. Uh, you know, every community needs people who agree with things, people who disagree with things, people with different with different attitudes, people with different ideas, and so on. You know, so it's not you know like every tribe needs to have somebody who is in the spotlight, somebody who is elsewhere. You know, the asterix and the poor guy with this musical instrument who always ends up on the tree because, <laughs> because nobody you need to have this guy in the community as well you cannot just have I mean yeah so it's not about everybody thinking the same it's actually quite the opposite I like when our ideas and my ideas personal ideas are challenged yeah. so it's about the broad range of different ways of understanding yeah I think that maybe that's a real difference between thinking of as infrastructure or as a school as well it's not a school of post-digital thought it's an, like the infrastructure enables much more space in there Sarah I'd like to, to ask you about the book your book part of the infrastructure that your book post-digital positionality that's like one specific aspect or approach to the whole post-digital um concept what um could you tell us more about post-digital positionality, the concept, and about your priorities or your aims for the book? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, if I may, just briefly on the infrastructure question, I just wanted to comment that um, the post-digital science and education journal is quite uh, unusual in the sense that there is almost, we've talked about Peter's research that's dialogic and um, conversational. We tend to, with people then when they put uh, articles forward, have almost a dialogic ed education, uh, you know, sort of editing process often with people. If the idea is exciting, you know, it can be developed and therefore, you know, there is a dialogical side to that. So I don't know, just throwing that in really because it occurred to me while Peter and, and, and you were talking. But on the topic of the book, um, Post-Digital Positionality, um, main priority is to finish it really soon <laughs> very very hard at the moment um but you know i have promised that uh, i've extended the deadline a little because of all the interesting examples that are coming up with the covid19 and you you feel that you you know you can't not acknowledge some of this as well um, but what the book does is it takes its departure from this book, which is uh, my 2019 book, which is The Labour of Words in Higher Education, which was actually a, a um, critical discourse analysis of policy language in higher education. 
And it's about the fact that humanity is not so much acknowledged in that language. And therefore, you know, we will talk about technologies and strategies achieving things rather than students or, or academics in universities. So I sort of rather irreverently called this policy following um, George Ritzer's um, uh, McDonaldization theory. And then it occurred to me towards the end of the book that as we were working with post-digital, that um, post-digital positionality really is a nice exploratory route to further debate on what's actually missing from that language and how we might resist that sort of way of writing policy and instead focus much more inclusively and also on, on the diversity of individuals, their positionalities. So um, what I have noticed really with higher education policy at the moment in the UK is a bit of a twofold problem where on the one hand we have human labour not referred to in the policy about how technologies will enhance everything on our behalf in terms of learning or whatever and then we also have digital te technologies missed out of what we're calling inclusivity, equality and diversity frameworks. So it's, it's rather a curious situation for us. And I'd be most interested to hear if, if this is reflected in other countries, um, in the way in which policy seems to be separated into these um, almost pigeonholes about different topics. Um, and, and we seem to be addressing what essentially is holistic in a rather unusual way. Um, and I think this is a real problem in an automating society as we're in, um, because universities, as Ben Williamson has said, um, are based on platform capitalism. He talks about the cloud campus, big data, artificial um, intelligence based systems that are now literally powering universities with lots of commercial connections. Um, unfortunately, we're all ignoring rather the sort of bias that can come in through systemic roots into all of that, the potential um, unethical sides to this and not necessarily acknowledging these in related policies. So really the sort of post-digital positionality side of things was how we might unlearn some of this ways of writing policy. Firstly, to acknowledge this post-digital campus that we um, could say is much broader than our universities. Um, it's life itself for us at the moment as we're teaching and, and researching and interacting online. Um, and so the kind of established inclusive practices that we've talked about in universities for a lot of time are changing. Um, and then secondly, if we can recognize that inclusivity and opportunities for individuals are very much being altered now in new post-digital ways. So you could have people who have forms of disadvantage, people who are um, have different identities, different cultural backgrounds, interacting very differently with a post-digital campus. Um, and just finally to say that um, by drawing attention then to positionality, you can bring those unique experiences to the forefront, the varied cultural backgrounds, the post-digital surroundings around each in individual. So with the post-digitality, you're also bringing, bringing the individual into there, right? And yeah. to, to, to see the sort of, I always imagine that as flows flowing around a person in their position. Interesting, that's exactly how I would describe it. And for anyone listening who sort of has ever had to account for their positionality in research when they've undertaken a study, it's, it's rather thinking of that applying to all of us. And, you know, there we are um, with whatever different forms of identity we, we perceive about ourselves intersecting with this post-digital context that we're in that's rather messy and uh, you know the opportunities that we perceive we either do or don't have within that. Can I stick with you for a minute Sarah and ask do you have do you have like a, a definition in the book where you have like one sentence where you say this is what post-digital means um, or where you say I, I know you've done this in other work you don't see what it means but you see what it does. Do you, can you can you can you give me one or two sentences like a really short form of what it means for you or what it does for you? I try to, and uh, you know, if I can really sort of. Oops, see that's so gone that, for me. Oh, sorry. I'll you were gone there for a moment for me. Sorry. <laughs> I'll start it again. Um, I was going to steal your own concept a little bit and say for me that it's about participation. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> Very much so, I would say, you know, it's a concept that's um, building critical uh, participatory cross-disciplinary -dis dialogue, which is hugely important to Peter, it's hugely important to me, and I think, you know, probably to many people um, who have interests in, in this area. We have a colleague um, at Wolverhampton, Prof Professor John Traxler, I work closely with, and uh, he's sort of started a fascinating debate with Peter and myself, um, and also with our colleague Stuart Connor. And basically it's a dialogue which is about uh, John's ideas on mobilities, our ideas on post-digital, and Stuart's ideas on futures research. And so we have this rich debate going on and it, it cuts across the disciplines and it cuts across so many things. So I think this for me is the essence of what we're doing with post-digital is it's bringing people in and many people feel they're within their own context. And I suddenly find, no, we're related to this other research that's going on over here human computer interaction, human data interaction, uh, you know, network learning, many different um, conversations coming together, many different disciplines. So for me, I think it's about that. And it's about sort of bringing in all of that subjectivity rather than cutting off any potential research trajectories that can come. We're, you know, bringing it all into connection. So participation. Hmm. So not a set, not a dogmatic sense of this is where we are and here's the border, but exactly. bringing the others in. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I think part of what you said there's a perfect like a perfect definition of how we understand the work with the post digital participation campus as well the Leibniz Science Campus, and also interesting I just want to link back for a minute to the the idea of inclusivity and and diversity and the the disconnect between tech technology technology as a fix which happens sometimes. I think there's a few projects particularly based in the campus that are trying to link these two together and especially uh, develop things which bring those ideas and not using that vocabulary, but I think that's really interesting. Potential for um, conversation there between the projects in the campus and your idea of post-digital positionality as well. well. That would be great to, to follow up. <laughs> Coming back to the definition, though, this 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 definition and definitional understanding sense, Peter, maybe I can come back to you again. I always think it's really useful to get a handle on a concept, to think it in relation to other concepts, like Sarah mentioned just now, human computer interaction, or there's things like like um, socio technical assemblages, which think the social and the technical together. There's social materiality, which thinks the social and the material together. Or there's one in German, which um, from Felix Stalder, there's a, he wrote a book called Cultura Digitalität. It's translated into English as the digital condition, I now found out, thank you. Um, it's quite influential in German discussions, thinking about our time today as the, the digital condition, whereas what you've been talking about and thinking and reflecting on is the post-digital condition. So how, where do you see the differences among any one or more of these different approaches? And what for you, what does it what does it do or what does it how does it help to privilege the sense of post digital rather than digital condition or socio technical assembly or any of the other ones well firstly uh, your question can be approached in so many ways uh, there's so many there's so many people writing about what i could call probably the contemporary uh, condition using many different words and what is interesting about the concept of the post-digital, I need to come back to this for a second, when you look into the history of the concept, you know, uh, the majority of concepts in technology-enhanced learning or e-learning or whatever will usually have an Anglo-Saxon background. But post-digital actually has a strong background in continental Europe. So there is a lot of early good post-digital work and now post-digital work today coming from places like Germany, Austria, and so on. So I would say the, the Netherlands, I would say that uh, the concept of the post-digital is has this strong uh, continental European background, unlike many other concepts which are pretty much uh, much more heavily influenced uh, or been developed within the Anglo-Saxon world. Now, to connect, uh, thanks a lot for introducing me to Felix Stalder's work. And uh, I read Culture de Digitalitet, and I think I will focus on this example because I think it's probably the closest to our, to our participants. So 
at the very beginning, I will immediately say that I understand Felix's views as very post-digital. And actually, in his introduction to Culture de Digital, Felix writes, uh, just a sec, uh, my understanding of the digital thus approximates the concept of the post-digital, which has been gaining currency the, over the past few years within critical media studies. After writing this, however, Felix explains some of the problems with the concept of the post-digital and then justifies his decision not to use the term post-digital in his book. I need to emphasize that the book was published in 2016 and probably written a few years previously. So Felix seems to have the same problems with the concept of the post-digital as many of us. And these problems include narrow focus to the arts, lack of substantial philosophy and theory, techno-determinism, some definitional issues, post, non-post, compost, and so on. But Kultur der Digitalität was written before post-digital science and education appeared on the scene, before your project on post-digital participation, before some other many very, very good and influential projects. And these days, I would say that we are actively moving towards re remedying or addressing many of the problems that Felix has identified earlier. So one article at a time and one book at a time. A few years ago, uh, uh, sorry, a few days ago, we just submitted the manuscript for the first book in post-digital science and education book series. It's called Post-Digital Humans, and it was edited by an amazing academic called Maggie Saban Baden. And the book contains a lot of good, strong philosophy, furthering the field in directions which have been largely unexplored in current post-digital literature. And Sarah, for instance, has written about the concept of the post and so on. And she actually addressed some of these uh, concerns that Felix earlier had. So... I have absolutely no disagreement with Felix's critique. At the time of writing, his arguments were indeed spot on. What I would like to emphasize is that as we develop the field further, many points in his critique have slowly become obsolete. And actually for almost each and every critique that I found in his introduction to Kultur de Digitalität, I can now point towards a good article in the past three or four years, which actually responds to these concerns and develops the field further. You know, we, live, we work in a rapidly developing field and we always need to examine concepts and critiques in the context of their making. I mean, I would really, in plain words, I would really say that Felix is actually one of us. But he's using, <laughs> he, he's using these words because there's a time he feels that these words are the most appropriate. Mm. Did, did something also draw you to the concept of post-digital as being more provocative than digital as well, though. It, it, it's like post-digital, as I say, I wrote this, post-digital, any post makes you think, makes you stop and think. Um, and the digital condition, I think it's a fantastic book. It's, it describes it the world in which we live really well. But but if, you, if someone who doesn't read the book could hear the digital condition and think, yes, more digitalization, more technological fixes, yes. Maybe we shouldn't listen to people who don't read the book and just see the title. But still, I have the feeling the word post-digital, because it's less used in other contexts, it has a specific purchase or a specific offer to start a conversation or something like that. Okay, I'll, I'll approach the answer to your question slightly differently because because this is simply how I felt at the time and I guess not only myself but also Sarah and other uh, and other people who were really actively involved in in the post who are actively involved in the journal and the book series the thing is that whenever you have a, a concept something like uh, technology enhanced learning or network learning or whatever this concept is uh, uh, immediately I would say burdened with a certain tradition with certain set of canons, with certain type of philosophy behind it. So somebody will say, this is network learning, this is not network learning, this is technology enhanced learning, this is not technology enhanced learning, and so on. And we wanted to start something that would be not burdened and not restricted by existing canons. We wanted to start with something a bit more from the scratch. And at the same time, uh, the concept of the post-digital, which started in artistic, art, artistic circles, it started actually in music and in painting and in conceptual arts and so on. I mean, these are the first places, these are the first communities which actually mentioned and explored the concept of the post-digital. I mean, the first places that, that, the, that the word post-digital was used was actually those uh, big, big, big exhibitions of electronic art and stuff like that. So 
so there was this concept which was has been uh, kind of a bit developed within the concept of the art but it actually allowed us to have an open space a blank field that we could fill in filled in with different meanings and with different understandings and with different approaches that we wanted to do so uh, and and this is this is the idea the idea was to have kind of some kind of a, 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 a history and some kind of background, but then again, to be free enough to be able to do to do something else. And I would, and I would like to say that we are not the only ones. I mean, you know, postmodernism, futurism, many, many, many things that we are currently using within the humanities and the social sciences as a normal have actually are actually based on concepts which started in the arts. So we just are probably came on top of this long tradition and we did the same thing that people did maybe 100 years ago. So it's not, it's not so uncommon, it's so <laughs> unusual. And then they're drawn across to make sense of the social, social, sociological aspects or social part or philosophical part of the world. Yeah, Sarah, maybe I could come to you just now with that that word post. Peter just mentioned just now these different posts: postmodernism, posthumanism, postpunk, post post colonialism, all sorts of posts. How does you've written also about the word the post post as a prefix does? So what does it? How does what does it mean to you? What, how does it relate to these other posts? And there's always the the concern by some people that post just means coming after. And like we're not po- in in Germany, people will say we're not post digital yet. We're not even digital yet. But there's a bunch of other associations with the post that I would love to hear your impression of or your position on. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, as Peter was talking just now and, and uh, the comments you were just making just then, it, it came to mind that it's a bit of a post-digital playground, really, in which we've left all of the older toys and brought all of the new electronic ones in as well. And, uh, you know, and so nothing is sort of removed. So in a sense, we haven't um, just, you know, sort of pushed on ahead and left things behind. But if, if I sort of put this in the context of the um, the article that Christine and I wrote that you've, you've been referring to in a post-digital science and education. I mean, we argue in that paper that the prefix post is um, appearing to act in these various different contexts of um, post-modernism, post-industrial, uh, post-humanism, etc. And uh, suggests that sort of it's acting in a way that, well, modernism or humanism are, are needing questioning or reworking. And then we've sort of raised the question, well, OK, if that's the case, then what what actually gets posted? You know, what goes with you in that post um, scenario or situation? And then that would sort of mean what you keep, what you rework. And then what actually gets composted um, or left to rot away? And, and Christine and I, obviously, we amused ourselves somewhat as we were writing about compost as well as as, as post. Um, so I think in the term post digital, um, we're not post, uh, we're not sort of privileging it, it exactly. More we're sort of putting it forward as this shared practice or um, space, this this playground, if you like, of learning that uh, everybody's welcome in and uh, can contribute to and bring their own toys and, and all that you, you know, you might do with old and new media, but also old and new theories. So, you know, I don't think post-digital in our, our interpretation shared amongst the community throws much out. You know, we're a bunch of hoarders by the sound of it. And then we, you know, we, we're actually sort of almost, uh, you know, hoarding more as people bring all of that in. But it helps, I think, because then we see it as cohabiting artifacts. So that's something that we, we said. And it's sort of these in, enmesh with economy, with biology, with politics, with culture, individual identities, etc. And, and Christine and I talked about it more as convergence then rather than simply going beyond. So, you know, we were um, talking about being in a post digital age now where nothing has been composted. Um, you know, we just have new, perhaps shared um, challenges, uh, possibilities across all aspects of, of social life. Um, so that's sort of the way that that, that article was, was framed. Um, and hopefully this brings new avenues, brings new ways that um, we can also think about the discourse that we use in terms of, 
of what we're talking about here, um, discourse by meaning language in use and, and you know how that can shape what we believe is possible as well as how we might reshape that discourse through uh, post-digital. In the sense also that the word post-digital itself shapes how we do research or how we see and how we act in the in the world? I would say so, but I would say very much as, as Peter said, um, you know, right from the start, uh, on a community basis, really, an ever changing basis where, you know, as, as I see the new articles coming up in the journal, I'm constantly jumping on board with something somebody's brought. There's a wonderful one Peter will remember to, that's to do with squids and something, you know. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I suddenly I love the way because I noticed just then you were writing down digital playground for listen for listeners. And it's it sort of as we throw in these new ideas, it makes us think again. You'll remember, Peter, which the, the squid article is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Irish guys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that's the thing really is, you know, jumping on board and, and running with, you know, each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about the squid? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember Peter, the the article? I can't remember the author. It's um, a yeah, it's an article which is a speculative science fiction. It's basically borderline between arts and humanities. And what the authors did, they actually wrote a short science fiction story about the year two thousand fifty, in which in which there is this uh, whole new world which takes place which had which is now very very obviously post digital and then they try to and then they draw some also i mean i'll some 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 conclusions for our post digital present i think that i actually mixed it up with another article but anyway i'll put both links i'll put both links in chat i can say the title now because i did a quick look up it's called everything you always wanted to know about being post digital but were afraid to ask about <laughs> Weird, and so perfect. <laughs> <it's really> googled. <laughs> I love, I love that the journal and the infrastructure, and probably the book series as well, has the space to have this kind of research as well. There was also the this pandemic will not be on Zoom article, which yeah, which yeah, yeah, which. which which makes us think. These are articles which make us think that step outside the maybe classic way of doing social science. I, I really appreciate this in the journal. Yeah. Um, just to come back for a moment, when you said modernism needs questioning is one thing you said. So that means with post-digital, the digital needs questioning. It's like a core underlying theme that I'm hearing from, from various answers you've, get, you've given so far. Digital needs questioning. It's not a technological fix. It's not, but it's also not a certain fixed in stone definition, this or or research approach or school of scholarship. It's a community. So and a community questions each other constantly in that sense. Yes, absolutely. I think um, you know, the the problem that I've had over the years with technology enhanced learning is this automatic assumption that you know you have digital you have automatic enhancement the, these kinds of assumptions that that I seem to go with as you said the technological fix and I think um, you know it's it's just allowing us then to constantly open that up because otherwise that narrative seems to be so dominant it's very much um, economically fueled in capitalism that we talk in this rational way of, about technology. We don't treat it as post-human. We treat it as something that is coming in here to, to save the day for us rather than, you know, uh, being, well, as we, we are really enmeshed with it now, um, mutually constituted as, um, um, I can't remember who said it, was it? Um, uh, Judy Wackman, I think, you know, mutually constituted by technology. Mm. No longer, no longer separating out into offline, online lives, whichever. Yes. Yeah. There, there's a couple of questions I'd like to turn to from the from the chat, from the Tweed back chat. One is, um, first, Sarah, you mentioned some recent post digital examples from the COVID nineteen pandemic. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more, or go into some examples? 
Oh, well, there's so many, isn't there? This is the, the really challenging thing. So I have been as fast as I've been writing this book, rushing, you know, from news story after news story about things like the app, the testing and tracing app, or the um, a fascinate, one that fascinated me recently um, in the UK that may have made it um, to uh, the audience to, to see was the use of an Excel spreadsheet to somehow record data about cases and then that not being the right tool, it not being a database and therefore suddenly lots of data about the cases of COVID being missed off and then not reported until later on. And of course, you know, we've had again in the UK, real problems with arguments about algorithms, algorithms, um, you know, deciding student grades, as opposed to teachers, um, you know, sort of upping the grades on their students and all of the, the arguments that this caused. So as, as these different cases keep arising and there are many, many more of them and, you know, on, on a daily, sometimes several times a day basis, you know, world, worldwide cases of incidents of things that seem to be cutting across the bio, biological with the virus, across the informational, across the um, digital, post-digital, um, human side of things. I'm finding that I'm writing these in as fast as I can to help illustrate points um, of post-digital positionality, the way that often, um, you know, the, such a situation can maybe disadvantage somebody who's already in a disadvantaged situation and sh to, sh to show how this could potentially happen. So much more nuanced things than we would normally just assume about technology coming in to help save us from this virus. Um, you know, uh, uh, in the broadest sense with science and technology um, as they're being used at the moment. Peter, do you want to add something to that? No, I think that Sarah answered the question <laughs> perfectly. Okay, I would, I'll move on to the next. We've got a couple more questions. I want to ask two questions together and I'll start with you, Peter. Maybe Sarah, you want to jump in as well. One question is, how do you think concepts such as intersectionality, difference, exclusion or even culture, very much political concepts with their own specific traditions, how much do you think these concepts need to be reworked with reference to post-digital? That was one. And the other question is related. So I'll ask them together. Which current critical position towards the concept of post-digital do you think is most challenging or interesting or worth thinking about at the moment? So in two directions, these questions. Well, I actually started replying to these questions in chat while Sarah was uh, talking. So I'll just reiterate and explain a bit more what I wrote there. Actually, I think that the key challenge of the post-digital condition at the moment is this relationship between biology and, and, and the digital, biology and physics. Because if you take a look at digital computers, all these digital computers actually come from transistors and other devices, which are actually physics. And 20th century was really the century of physics from Albert Einstein's early you know, theories of such as relativity and so on, to, to, to nuclear energy, cold war, whatever. You could say the 20th century was really marked by physics. But with the cloning of Dolly the Sheep, 21st century is definitely more a uh, century of biology by now than it is the century of physics. So the biggest breakthroughs happen in biology. The biggest, uh, biology gets uh, the most of funding. Biology is, and even traditional fields such as physics and chemistry and so on, are usually becoming biophysics, biochemistry, bio this and bio that. And now in the pandemic, we especially see this aspect of the post-digital condition where things like when you read uh, Shoshana Zuboff's, you know, surveillance capitalism, or when you take a look at those recent quite famous you know netflix documentaries such as the social dilemma and everything what you can basically see that uh, it's not just that our usage of the digital is somehow external to people's bodies and external to people's minds then becomes so deeply ingrained with us that you cannot really say where the digital or the physical stops and where the biology biological or the human begins so speaking about the post-digital and speaking about all these 
transformations of all these concepts. I think that these concepts should be rebuilt with, with an eye on the idea that it's a very post-humanist thing, but post-humanism as a, as, a, as a philosophy, as a movement, is actually, well, I wouldn't say behind, but this traditional post-humanism, such as you know, Captain Hales or Donna Haraway or whatever, is definitely behind these new developments. We are now not just talking about radical equality between human and non-human actors, such as when Sean Bain from Edinburgh puts people to talk with automated bots and then looks how they how they interact and so on. It's about that we are becoming automated bots and automated bots are becoming more biological in a way. And it, it, there's really, there's really this, this distinction really, really, really uh, gets even, even more blurred up to the point where I'm not sure where it, where it can even be defined even philosophically or theoretically. So I think that speaking of traditional concepts, that we, we cannot just take those concepts and uh, 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 somehow post-digitalize them, if it's a good objective, but that we should actually rebuild them from the scratch, uh, blending this idea of bioinformationalism or digital, biodigital, together with, with, with other things which are, which are implicated in these concepts. So the same like positionality. I mean, the question is who, whose position? I mean, who am I? And that's why the first book in the post-digital science and education book series is exactly on post-digital humans. It's not an accident. Like, who are the post-digital humans? Are we just biological? Are we not just biological? And so on. And it's especially important in this age of the pandemic. I mean, I'm hoping to, perhaps a bit later, to present some of the recent developments that the journal did about uh, in and around the COVID because we, did, we really did a lot of work about the pandemic. But the idea is that, that we cannot really dis make a clear distinction between, between biology and physics anymore or between information and, uh, and, and, and uh, digital and analog or information and biology or you know, these things. I think that's the key thing. What does that do with, this is a sort of tangential question, but what does that do with disciplines? There's always a big discussion. Do we need specific people who understand biology and specific people who understand information to come together and work on these problems? Or they, because the idea behind that is because they both bring deep knowledge in biology or in information, whatever. Or do we need people to understand all of it together? Well, I think that we need to understand all of it together. I'm sorry if, if the question was for me. But, but the idea is that we have traditional, pose, traditional disciplines for a very good reason. I mean, I was trained like a physicist. So my first degree was in physics and engineering. And then I moved to humanities and social sciences and philosophy and so on. And actually, my training in physics really, really helped me so much. With, 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 with thinking about the post-digital. And actually, my first job was for CERN. And it, 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 it was really interesting because this, this thing is something that was, you know, uh, 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 understanding those connections and how really physics understands the world and then moving it beyond physics and then moving it somewhere else. I think it's hugely important to have this elementary primary training. And I think that traditional disciplines are here for a good, very, very good reason. Having said that, Post-digital research recognizes this interconnectedness of life and work and many other things, including economy. But unlike other systems of knowledge production, which clearly favor one of the uh, disciplinary approaches, uh, the post-digital approach is a bit different. It transcends traditional disciplines. But it doesn't mean that it hates the disciplines and that it thinks that the disciplines are bad. Disciplines are necessary to train us in order to start working something there. I mean, without the disciplines, we cannot move. And I just want to add one more thing, which is hugely important and which somehow uh, a lot of the time skips uh, those methodological discussions. And unfortunately, that's political economy. I mean, these days, within the research, higher education, institute, landscapes, whatever, research is largely driven by funding. And for as soon as you, as you drive research by funding, you want certain tangible results. And tangible results or results that can be 
well, made into money, usually come from single disciplines because it's much easier to get there. So, you know, so you do something in information science or do something in biology. I mean, it's quite straightforward. Like, whoever finds the, Q, the, 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 the vaccine for COVID-19 will be very rich. It's very simple. Now, if you move this to, 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 to in transdisciplinary or post-disciplinary research, where even research questions are not very well defined in the first place, then you will see that this research is much less marketable. So the thing is that also when we speak about research, it's also hugely important to say that it's not all just about epistemology and philosophy and all these things. There's a lot going on within the, the context of political economy. And there is a lot going on where people simply need to do a certain type of research to survive in the marketplace. And so, so, so post-digital research is about escaping this borders of the marketplace. And post-digital, the post-digital perspective as I see it, or as we probably see it as a community, has strong foundations in critical pedagogy and critical theory as well. So there is this hugely important political aspect, class aspect, and so on. We cannot imagine today, speaking of knowledge as a social product, about my latest book on knowledge, socialism, and so on, we cannot speak about knowledge uh, as separate or divorced from knowledge economy. We do need to connect these things. I mean, otherwise we can't work, work together. So to go back to your question, absolutely yes. We, post-digital research is good disciplinary research. It's also good post-disciplinary research. It's not really good research, it's just good research. Let's see if I can come right back. Thank you, Peter. And that 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 also answers a thing I've been thinking about in that the idea of critique, how much the idea of critique is already really embedded into post-digital research, which is kind of what these two questions also um, speak to. I wonder, Sarah, do you want to add something from your from a in different position or to agree or, or disagree um, about the idea of this intersectionality, difference, exclusion, or culture? How these words need to be, how these concepts need to be reworked with reference to the post-digital, the, the political economy is one really important aspect which speaks to that question already. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I'd entirely agree with uh, all that Peter was saying about the political economy, it's hugely important. And then um, I think on top of that, the ongoing dialogue, two-way dialogue between the humanities and the computing, to put it very, very broadly, if you sort of, you know, the science and the humanities, um, I think that that can be really helpful with this. I think intersectionality is a you know, it's a very important concept in the, the book that I'm writing currently. And I think, you know, to, to see that at many different levels, and of course I'm writing from a, a, a positionality point of view, but if we see it very broadly that um, this dialogue across computing and, and humanities, um, I was thinking a little bit while uh, Peter was talking about Gary Hall's work. Um, he runs the Post Digital Centre at Coventry University. And I read something from a few years ago where he was saying, well, you don't need to have these as equal they are unequal, um, these, the way in which we train computer scientists, the way in which we uh, train people through the humanities, but to have this um, you know, more or less disruption across these areas can be very helpful for us to see you know, where there are, might be bias and where, you know, where we actually can, can bring um, understandings. And uh, so I think one of the, the more ridiculous, I seem to be bringing the ridiculous examples is um, people, literally sitting around with a computer attempting to to knit with that computer and to see what that actually brings about that interaction and this was an example through human computer interaction and there are many others and um, these are to me I, I'm finding these huge fun because you can just begin to see where you might be meeting some some issues when you start to do, do these these kinds of things so I guess you know disruption perhaps is is quite helpful because otherwise the political economy side of it, it you know, we, we're very much ingrained in perhaps what we're told to believe. And yeah, and that, that, that shows, it speaks to the whole idea of change and how change 
where is change coming from? These micro interactions like knitting with a computer or whatever. Yeah. Speaking of change, and one final question maybe, um, if there's no more questions from the other participants, would be the COVID thing, the corona. Peter, you mentioned it earlier that you've done a lot of work on corona. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll give you a bit of a background. I, so uh, in December 2019, I was a visiting professor at Beijing Normal University, and I stayed in close touch with my Chinese colleagues. So when the corona exploded in Europe in February or March, I had a pretty good feeling of what's going to happen because my friends would email me and say, look, this is happening now. So in early March, I wrote an emergency editorial uh, for post-digital science and education, and I also launched the call for various types of COVID-related papers. And post-digital science and education was amongst the first uh, journals, if I may say, in the humanities and social sciences in the world who actually did this. So already in March, we got contacted by the World Health Organization and a few other institutions to share our results. And actually, if you Google some of the articles from... Uh, post-digital science and education, you will find them on various repositories, such as the World Health Organization and so on. So during the past months, we published almost 60 articles on COVID-19, uh, launched the issue last week. The collection has more than 200 authors from all five continents and so on. And Sarah and I recently wrote, it's a true history of our pandemic present. So Last week, I was invited by somebody else in another journal to write a short overview article about those, all those things. And I identified three main issues or themes or groups of issues and themes within this huge body of work. So the first one is lived experiences and their responses. The second one is politics. And the third one is philosophy. So philosophy is important because it gives us a sense of what is right and what is wrong, as well as the sense of our own responsibility. Politics is important because it tackles burning problems of collective decision making in the age of fake news and post truth. And documenting our life exp lived experience of the COVID 19 pandemic, I mean, as teachers, learners, as human beings, is actually crucial for making sense of our post digital, post COVID 19, post, 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 post reality. But responding to these experiences for our narrow systems of neoliberal uh, education is not a solution. I mean, it's a natural and necessary move. We do need to know how we will set up this presentation, right? But, but we also do need to look beyond that. And I believe that it's our duty as educators or researchers of human to move beyond this narrow focus to education and technology and to address human problems in their post-digital totality. So post-digital theory is con conventionally positioned between the analog, the analog and the digital, and also between various traditional disciplines to address challenges related to COVID-19, which was, as I said, recognized also by players like the World Health Organization. But obviously in the face of COVID-19, those bioinformational aspects I was talking about earlier have ended up under the spotlight. However, I would argue that the key contribution of post-digital theory is not in these theoretical matters. So in my view, post-digital theory does not stop at explaining the world. I mean, the key goal of post-digital theory, its key mission for me, at least my personal mission, if you want, is to actively participate in development of the world and to develop the, wild, the wild, widest spheres of society to participate as well. So this is, as I said earlier, the legacy of the critical pedagogy movement, which is one of the many foundational worldviews and approaches behind post-digital thinking. So uh, the corona has affected my views to the post-digital because it made me even more certain that our present moment requires much more post-digital thinking. And it also shows me that actually what we need to really to do, that we probably need these days need more post-digital thinking than ever. I do think that, and some of the articles point to this, that this, the lived experience which you mentioned, one of these three things that so many more people have now said, oh, yes, my life is totally post-digital, now I realise. Yeah, well, we... Sitting in Zoom, etc., as we are, and having this connection and stuff. Uh, as a part of this effort, we did one, I mean, I can only say amazing article, where... Uh, we asked, Sarah and I asked for, this is the link in the chat now, uh, we asked people to describe their early experiences of a lockdown. So it was March, we were locked down in our houses and we asked people, write us about what you're doing right now and how you are responding to the crisis. And take a photo, take your phone and take a photo of your workspace. And we ended up in, the art in an article 
with participants from more than 30 countries, 89 or 84, something like that, in, in between 80 and 90 responses together with photos of their workspaces. Huge beast of an article, two or 300 pages, almost a book. But this is amazing how people, and then you can see literally how the same thing that's bothering you also bothers somebody in China or somebody in India or somebody in, I mean, we had, we had you know, since this article is published, I'm in touch with its authors. So in the meantime, we had one baby was born. <laughs> we had, you know, there's so much life going on to it. And, and, and I think it's really important to record those experiences but also, we should not take a look at these things instrumentally. So how can we improve people's experience? It's not about that. It's about how can we improve the whole environment so that people can have a better, better, better understanding and better experience of, of the whole situation, not just how to make teachers teach better under, under pandemic conditions. Yes. Thank you. That is... And we are now at one o'clock and that is almost the perfect final line as well, <laughs> to improve the whole condition and to reflect on and think about the whole condition in which we live today. I would have so many more questions. I would like to ask some more, but we need to stop because it is one o'clock. Lunchtime is over. The bell is ringing. <laughs> so if I can just thank you hugely again for making time to join us today with our first post-digital lunch of the Leibniz Science Campus Post-Digital Participation in Braunschweig. Thank you, Sarah Hayes. Thank you, Peter Jandrich. Um, yeah, and thank you all the participants from the campus and from beyond the campus who joined us today and who might see this in the future as well. Felicitas, thank you so much for inviting us. It, it was a brilliant conversation. I really enjoyed it and I hope to continue this in the future. Absolutely. Yes, thank you hugely and look forward to more. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, me too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.